are and we are rolling now welcome back to edric poon and company the podcast where anybody can inspire everybody hi i'm edric and on this episode of the podcast we're deep diving into the neuroscience of empathy what is it what it is what it means and how it actually fits into an organization can one truly understand and apply the rules of one's human brain into the masses of a large organization of hundreds of people? If so, how? This is a weird one. And uh, that being said, my brain's too small to actually do these things. So we've got somebody who's very, very well-versed in the topic. Now, she's an organizational psychology consultant. She's a public speaker, a life and career coach, a mother of two. She's got scientific parenting under her belt. She's got such a long CV. Many of you might even know her as VJ Marissa. <laughs> For those of you who are old enough to understand MTV and you're based in Indonesia. Marissa, thank you so much. For joining the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here today. For those who need a background mm -hmm. on who you are, now you're the first person to come onto my podcast with an IMDB page. <laughs> okay. The fact of the matter is that you've got 13 movies, you know, <laughs> uh, in your list. Yeah, yes. I've done my research. Yes, okay. I can see that. I can see that. I usually don't lead with that, so no, I'm surprised. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody does because it's kind of like foo-foo kind of thing, you know. It's like, <laughs> oh, I've got an IMDb page. Look at me. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't even know I had one. Oh, th who created it? Then? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's amazing. You you mean that I, somebody else did the IMDb page for you? Ah, uh, it's also like Wikipedia. They uh, like some people just do it for you, and suddenly you wake up one day and when you Google yourself and you go, oh, I saw you have a Wikipedia page, and you go, I did. I don't even know I had one. You've got that, but way before that, you are on MTV. That's right. right. That's and right. After which, mm -hmm. somehow or other, you ended up being a, a TV presenter. Eventually, you moved. To Singapore. To Singapore. If I'm not wrong, you got married in 2016, right? Yeah. And you're the mother of two beautiful children. That's right. right? Uh, Ali and Ollie, is that yes, correct? Yes, correct. Then eventually you went into study what scientific parenting. You also did organizational psych psychology and now you're in neuroscience research psychology, and research yes. psychology. Yeah. Okay. Why I'm saying all of this, you're probably like wondering, why are you waffling, Edric? It's because <laughs> I'm trying to understand, number one, how does a TV presenter, actress take a break, have kids, and eventually, right, go into the depths of parenting, in the science of parenting, as well as the science of the human brain. Like, how does that transition happen? <laughs> it's, it, for me, it's kind of like playing with Legos and all of a sudden I'm building rocket ships. This does not make sense to me. But isn't that how it usually starts? Right. Isn't that where the children start to play with Lego and suddenly they realize that their dream is to go to the moon or oh. like to go into space and build their rocket ships? It doesn't apply to me because <laughs> I was the one who was always like <laughs> destroying every. So you were thing. Godzilla going through the Lego castles yeah. and just like taking right, it all down. Right. I, I love the movies so much. So yeah. I definitely enjoyed being uh, in that role of be the destroyer or, you know, but uh, stepping on the Legos was a different thing. Oh, that, yes. That was not fun. Yes, that hurts. Yes, yeah, so that hurts. The why parents and the kids. Why Godzilla never felt that pain mm -hmm. is the strangest thing. Anyway, I, I digress. Wait, like, what kind of triggered you and when, you know, I, I'm going to stop this TV thing mm -hmm. and I'm really going to deep dive into people's brains. Okay. I think it all started for me with the realization once I became pregnant and it made me ask, what kind of person I want to be and what kind of person do I want to be for my children. This um, there followed, was followed by simply the question, what kind of purpose do I want to fulfill in my life and what are my core values? And I think it's really an interesting time when you become a parent that you have this sense of introspection and really reevaluate your life. And there's many working or who are interested in the field of psychology is first and foremost the question, who am I? And what makes me tick? What makes me think the way I think? Why do I behave the way I behave? And why do I feel the way I feel? And really finding the mystery of that led me into finding the curiosity and mysteries of child psychology. How do these little people um, think and behave and how can we support their growth? first and foremost for my own children, but this really cascaded into my love for psychology and our human brain and mind. You invested quite a number of years to really switch. I and did. Yeah, I really applaud you for that kind of commitment because 
it almost sounded like you gave up an entire cushy lifestyle to start all over. I did. I think my husband would agree. Yeah. <laughs> with, with the things that you've picked up, I, I just want to get retrospective here. Be it whether you're acting, doing TV work or, or anything along those lines. Mm. What were the parallels that you could draw from those things back then, the lessons that you learned, and putting that into what you now know, into this topic of empathy? I think what I learned was I was able to forgive, first of all, myself for things that I didn't know before, oh. right? Because first and foremost, we're learning a lot about how we humans work, how our brains and our minds work. And then you suddenly have this realization and knowledge of like all of these things that you might regret, things that happened in your childhood, memories that you still are holding on to. And you suddenly are able to understand where you were coming from, where other people were coming from and how things have maybe developed and cascaded into moments and experiences in your life and you forgive yourself. So forgiving other people, forgiving my parents, yes, just how it was. And you go, I can move on now because I understand why it happened the way it did. The topic of forgiveness is one of the hardest things to do, I think. Forgiving others seems easier than forgiving yourself. That I do agree with. And I think if you also really look at where we live, okay, where we live, I mean like in a point of time, we are constantly worried about the past or the future, that we rarely are living in the present. How many things from your past are you carrying with you and you think about over and over again? And how many things in the future that you currently maybe have no control of? This is where, you know, when we were planning for this episode, right, we were like, okay, the conundrum here is that people are saying empathy is a feeling, but somehow there's, then we also stumbled upon this thing that it's also a cognizant, and cognitive approach. So mm. it's a mix of both things, to be aware of it and to act on it in a certain set pattern or behavior. It is. Mm. Like in a way you could like separate like empathy. It's a set of behaviors. And um, for example, there is like what we call, it's a cognitive response, but then there's also like an emotional and like physical aspect to it. For example, when we talk about cognitive empathy, which entails that you actually know what the emotion is you know what the person is feeling. So you have a connection to what is going on, like maybe a social concept that the person is like going through right now. But then you also have like the physical part to it, which is like another part where you feel physical distress in a way that you can relate to the feelings that this person is going to. And then the emotional aspect would be that you understand the emotions, the mix of emotions that a person is going through in a particular situation that you can empathize with because you feel it, you understand it, and then you can also like embody it. Oh, wow. Okay, so now dumb this down for me. It's a lot of words <laughs> that you use just now. What I'd like to know is that there's got to be some sort of like easier definition for us to understand empathy, right? Mm -hmm. So if you could really keep it super simple... Wow. What, how, would you, how would you crystallize what empathy is? I think it's easy to understand it when we compare it with the word sympathy. When we say we have sympathy for someone's situation or when you empathize with someone's situation. To keep it maybe blunt and easy is, are you a football fan? Or you kind of, I guess. Okay. For example, you are a diehard football fan for this club okay. and your club lost. And you are very sad about this because you are emotionally attached to this football club. So this sadness hits you way harder. Me, as like somebody who does not have this emotional connection to football, I will sympathize with your situation that your club lost, but it does not cause me any emotional or physical distress. You know, I understand that you are sad about this, but I do not really emotionally or physically understand because I don't know what you're going through because I do not have this emotional connection mm. to football right. in general. Empathy would be where you take it a step further and in simple terms, you are able to put yourself into somebody's shoes, into like the position that somebody is going through. For example, I 
can empathize with a person who has lost a parent because mm. I understand that this emotion of grief is a very difficult emotion to process. So I have the knowledge that death is a very difficult thing to process for lots of people. So there's like a cognitive part to it. You understand mm. what grief and death means and you understand what also love means. So there was this emotional connection between like a child and a parent of like love that you also can empathize with you because you understand this emotion. And then you could take it a step further because somebody who has lost a parent would know how it feels in that moment when mm. your world falls apart as you would know. That brings me to the next question, which is, um, I'm going to jump straight into the organizational part. Of okay, things. sure. I find it very fascinating that, you know, back in the day, right, when we look at how our parents used to work, they, they it was it felt almost like there was no sympathy or empathy, just put your head down, stick 10 toes into the ground and say, okay, I'm just going to do this. Nobody cares about your feelings because we need to put, you need to bring the bread back home, put money on the table, right? Mm -hmm. But nowadays, it's become a buzzword. Empathy. You know, you have to have an empathetic uh, uh, workplace. You know, you have to f have feelings in your workplace. So with this change in the direction between, let's say, the baby boomers and, uh, you know, what the Gen Zs are thinking mm -hmm. in this particular generation right now, what happened? When, when what has changed? One of the main things that has changed is that we are able to have more resources and more knowledge. Mm. So I think in general, not just like in an organizational setting, but also in a setting of like self-development and um, gaining more no knowledge and information, our generations and the generations to come are not bound by just authoritative figures and a limited resource of information. We can easily now go on the internet and have like so many different opinions and to educate ourselves at like what aligns with us. Mm. Back then, looking at the generations of our parents, they were simply following this one ruler <laughs> in the organization and this was the way how it was done because all companies did it this way. Mm. Nowadays, I think we do know better. And if we take it like a step even further back, let's ask ourselves how well did that do for our parents? How well did it do to not be emotionally attuned to your feelings and understanding your feelings? Look at our parents and how they were raised by their parents. You know, like you mentioned, like, just keep your feelings inside. Let's not talk about mm. our emotions. Emotions don't exist. Boys don't cry. I think is one of these mantras from like back then. They should have. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I was raised in, in a very similar fashion. But, uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. So it's an all-encompassing field because it's not just an organization. It's also what your home was like. It is what you were raised to be. And these values just do not align anymore with the digital times in which we are living in now. Mm. Now, people who work for organizations want to be valued because they know better, they have educated themselves, and they have also, for them, defined like, their own core values. If we talk about emotional intelligence, it is not just a nice skill to have. It is, for many, an essential core skill that you need to bring in leadership when you care for people, when you lead people, you want people to align with you. You want them to help you. You want them to be inspired by you and be motivated by you. Mm. You don't want people to simply follow a leader blindly. Right. Looking at history, we know how well that went for lots of yeah. <laughs> nations. Yeah, I'm starting to see it now because there's a bit of a reframe that I'm looking at it right now. Previously, it was kind of like, okay, this is the leadership style. How come these people aren't... Uh, getting it how come they're not following how come they're not uh, acting like they should mm. you know in that sense but now it's kind of like it's the other way around whereby okay our workforce is going to be like this because they are born they're bred this way so the leadership needs to change and we the leaders need to adapt to understand that companies where structure is hard to, mm. where organizational structure is hard to change because they follow this like organizational hierarchy or are we looking at young, dynamic um, startups or companies that want to bring this change right. and embody this change. And I think the, the balance will be somewhere in between. They say that you can't teach an old dog new tricks. 
<laughs> help me out here. Help me out. Yes. Help me out here. I think the beauty of it comes from the field of neuroplasticity, that it doesn't matter how old your brain mm. is, your brain is changing every day. And what you can do if you would like to change is simply expose yourself to new experiences. Your brain needs new perspectives and new ways of thinking. But also, I think the conundrum is that your brain really dislikes things that are new. So our brain loves to be able to predict what's going to happen. Mm. And that's where, in essence, the sentence comes from that you cannot teach an old dog new tricks because you think you have been thinking, doing and behaving and feeling this way for decades of years. And it is really in your brain. There's like shortcuts already that have mm. been made like neural pathways that define you. But the beauty is that you can change. The most important thing is that you need to be aware that you want to change and then take the courage to do things differently. For example, if people say how to teach empathy, it's Simply, for example, by volunteering, taking on new perspectives, understanding new experiences and really coming for it with an open mind and open heart. Mm. I think if you say, okay, this is something that I just want to get off my checklist, it's not going to work. You really need to immerse yourself into the emotions, but also be able to sit and understand your own emotions. So I think the first part is that you understand your own emotions also first and how to regulate them appropriately. Right. So it sounds like there's a process. There is a set process that can be put into a company. These are ideas. It's ideas. not necessarily that, you, that this is exactly the way, right. but these are like some ideas that we could do in our everyday life. Yeah, you got to yeah. practice it consistently. That's the idea, right? If you don't, it's just a one-time thing. It's like, oh, okay, yeah, I feel for you. Okay, great, bye. Yes. And then that's it. It's, it's, it's dead town, right? Nothing, it doesn't work. Yeah, you really need to immerse yourself yeah. into the new experiences. Yeah. I was having a discussion with uh, mm -hmm. a couple of people within the HR realm about okay. leadership, Interesting. training, development, that yeah. kind of thing. And I posed the question to them, which was uh, something we talked about. Mm -hmm. If, if we needed to teach leaders or show them the change in the empathy, right? There are also leaders out there who are like borderline sociopaths, right? Who don't really feel <laughs> anything. So, which, which means that, how, how do you teach someone like that? Because there was this documentary that I saw mm -hmm. and it was so fascinating because it was about how a clinically certified sociopath had to go through life in school to understand how people felt. Because... Mm -hmm. As a sociopath, you don't give a shit about how people feel. It's so utilitarian. You do this, you do that, and that's it, right? I don't feel anything. But if, let's say, that person really grows up and perhaps there are people like that uh, who, who, who have that condition, like what you mentioned, it's probably a burnt gland somewhere, right? And how do you teach them something like that? Because it almost sounds like a playbook that they go, okay, if, if, a, if scenario A happens, I respond in you know, formula A. Mm -hmm. If scenario B happens, then I'll use formula B. So it's so formulaic. It's so, it, it almost sounds like you can teach it and practice it, but it doesn't feel sincere anymore. It's so weird. It's true. But at the same time, this is like also how we learn driving, right? So when okay, so I, I know. Tell me more, tell me more. <laughs> because you have, if there's something that is hard to grasp, in general, when we talk about learning something, if there is something that is hard to grasp for you because it's new, that means your brain is not aware of what are the next steps to go through because it doesn't come intuitively because you have not practiced it over and over again. So let's break it simply down into comparing it with driving. When you first learned how to drive, there is like manually this step and then followed by this step. You check your mirror, you put your hands on the steering wheel, you look back, there is like a code kind of to follow mm -hmm. that makes driving an automated process. And the more you do it over and over again, the less you think about it because your brain can predict what the next steps are. So one day suddenly you find yourself already, oh my God, I can drive, I can listen to the radio, I can daydream at the same time because it has become an automated intuitive process. Until you realize a tree appears in front of you. <laughs> Hopefully not. Hopefully not. <laughs> so if you would want to break it down like that for a person that 
is not biologically predisposition to have um, to to have uh, problems with like developing empathy. We can like touch on that a little bit later. Mm. Um, I would say it is possible to teach it. Say, say hypothetically, this person has never seen any hardship in their life. Has been growing up in a bubble. Has been getting everything that they want and has been on this power hungry um, stream in their life and never seeing or considering other people's feelings. That almost sounds great. <laughs> Does it though? Does it really? <laughs> so if you on. then would try to teach this person and say, okay, you need to understand how other people feel. You can go and volunteer. You need to see. Maybe this person has never seen hardship, has never seen poverty. Mm. So once you immerse them in these situations and immerse their brains into situations that are new for them, then they can develop new perspectives. This is really important that you understand other people's perspectives mm. because you need to be able to put yourself into other people's shoes for that matter. And then what could be a formula going through this step and this step and this step and this step can then maybe one day become something totally intuitive. I'm saying this because if you have been thinking and behaving and feeling a certain way for decades, this means that your neural pathways have done it this certain way for a very long time. Mm. That's why change is so incredibly uncomfortable to us. Right. And it feels so hard because we don't know how and we don't know what is on the other side mm. and taking the first step is really always the hardest to really put your first foot into the door to your new path can you can this apply to kids as well because i'm looking at it and it's like okay yes. do you get kids to volunteer too is that how you do it yes i think you immerse ev kids from a young age try to make sense of the world right for them it is really they are coming to this world pure and learning and just taking it all in. So it's really from the beginning, like having social connection and understanding how other people feel, because for them, their world mainly is about themselves and their families. But like to understand what happens if I don't share with other people, what happens if I inflict pain, not voluntarily, uh, not voluntarily or um, not intended. What happens then to understand that other people do have feelings? But then there's obviously also like a cognitive process that happens that they cannot grasp everything mm. at a very young age. So this happens usually like around four, five, six, seven, where they can try for the first time to fully understand other children and other adults also like mental states and what it means that I think differently than you. Oh, wow. Okay. That... That really blows my mind because I've always had this idea that because we're older, we're more mature, so to speak, right? That means that our approach to life and approach to learning should be different. But truth is, we're pretty much still learning the same way as kids do. We are learning every day. I think if you expose yourself to the ability that you can learn every day, this is the beauty of the brain that it does not mean that who you are today is who you're going to be tomorrow or in a year from now. Mm. I mean, every person, when you look back a couple of years and you go, this person seems foreign to me because it is a part of me and part of my past, but I have grown so much because I've learned so much. I have seen so much. And isn't that the beauty of life as well? I would not want to look back and say, hey, the person that was me last year is exactly the person that I am today. Because then I would go, that means I learned nothing. Not meaning that life is not about making mistakes and like failures, but you learn from them to grow from them. Mm. Wow, this really takes me... This, this, this thing gets really deep now because <laughs> all of a sudden, it makes me question everything in terms of the way that I can learn and in terms of the way that I should learn. Because there was, there was a thought the other day, you know, when I was just preparing for this podcast. I was really thinking about it and... I had to juxtapose this idea mm. of what if my child were doing the job that I'm doing? How would that approach be different? How would that child learn? You know, as a 10-year-old or as a 12-year-old, mm -hmm. how would that person, that little person, approach problems mm -hmm. in solving? Or then, then I realized that, hey, there's so many inhibitions, right, that we as adults have 
And if, they sh if we shed them, the ability to ask questions without feeling shy, without thinking about guilt, shame, or anything like that. And not only that, the armor that we took, take away, we're also able to approach people better, talk to them a little bit more. You know, uh, I don't know. It's kind of like, it's so much easier to give up a seat in the train that way. Let's put it that way. Absolutely. I do agree. Um, and when you speak of these inhibitions, it's in a way looking also back, speaking again of the organizational settings from generations ago, right? Where emotional intelligence was not even a word back then. And empathy was seen as a weakness, yeah. right? Where people were believed to just put their head down and follow a leader blindly in a way. And nowadays, it's really more about the social connection. But in us growing up, from our own upbringing, from the settings in school, from the education system maybe, from our young adulthood careers. We are always taking on so many conditions that it's hard sometimes to let them go because this is something that has kept us safe, mm. that we have believed in also for so long. Limiting beliefs, for example, have started for many people from a very young age, just simply because, let's just say, a parent has called their, ch their child, oh, um, she's just shy, or he's just shy. And they have internalized, I am a shy person, and have carried that for all their lives. But this might not even be true. But because they have internalized this so much, this is what they think that they are. I am just a shy person. Mm. And then coming to an organizational settings, you don't want to speak up, you keep your head down. But the beauty is that we need to really look at our beliefs and look at our emotions, understand ourselves. This is really hard. It sounds so easy. I know who I am. Is that true? Do you really know who you are? Do you really know no, who is that little voice in your head all the time? No, I, I think many of us actually only recognize a few layers of ourselves. Um, but to be really peel everything back and to know who you are at the very core, that is the, the mo one of the most difficult things to do, right? Because you have to get rid of ego, pride, uh, 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 insecurities. You have to get rid of mental models of who I think my parents wanted me to be, who I believe I wanted to be, what my ambition is, what other people might have this perception of me. There's so many layers to peel back. It's so difficult to actually know exactly 100% of who we are, right? I think that's why philosophers kept talking about it for, for hundreds and hundreds of years and nobody still has a bloody answer. That's true, that's <laughs> true. And at the end of the day, if you really think about it, the only person who can answer that question is you. Yeah. Because nobody knows you and all these different selves that you have, right? Like, I'm a daughter, I'm a mother, I'm a sister, I'm a friend. I these think are all I am, yes. So, yeah, <laughs> but um, coming back to the topic of empathy, when you ask yourself these questions, mm. you let yourself be vulnerable. And when mm. you let yourself be, be vulnerable, it opens your heart up to being also able to take on other people's energies and to feel other people's pain because you are coming from a place that is not from a mm. place of ego. Agreed, agreed. Uh, again, that is so, so very, very difficult to do. I mean, I cannot imagine that. Now, when, when you do all your research and all of this, right, mm -hmm. how much... I mean, is it a very visual thing? Do you have to look at MRIs and, and see shit moving all over the place on pictures? Like, you know, I, I just watch... I, look, I only watch what's on YouTube or on TV, right? I know nothing about this stuff. I cannot read medical journals because it's too many words. But you, like, have to see stuff moving around and see, like, a, is there a black patch or a red patch somewhere? Well, what do you see? You can. You can. I think it depends, like, what exactly you are looking for. Uh -huh. So I think everything is dependent on context, Right. If you are looking at like fMRI studies or if you um, sorry if you're looking at fMRI studies or if you're looking at MRI studies, um, it really depends what you're looking for. You can also simply read the report which also helps, but visual things also help. Yeah <laughs> sure. Yeah, I know I'm coming across like super like you know ignorant right now. Right? No, but, not at all, not at all. The truth is if you don't ask, you don't get the answers right. No, it's true. I think like one interesting thing is that people believe just because I've recently or I'm still like doing a big study about emotions is that 
people used to believe that every emotion has uh, a neural fingerprint in the brain. That's what mm. you were like mentioning before, that this is exactly where empathy is. This is exactly where uh, sadness is. Right. And this is where happiness is. Well, until today, this has not been proven. So what it means is that every emotion that we feel has uses different processes mm. at once. So it's not that there's a special seed for this emotion or the other emotion. Right. So it means that also because lots of different factors are involved in emotions and emotion processing, it also means that if you have an injury to your brain that affects your brain's health, this could also have an effect on how you process emotions because certain regions might not be mm. functioning anymore. So it is really important to understand that your brain's health has a direct effect on your mind's health and it can alter your mind. Right. Yeah, I, I think there was a there was, there was this one documentary that they were doing about uh, um, neural studies as well as neurosurgery. So a Basically, a piece of your brain was cut out, right? And that was supposedly where, I don't know, a certain emotion was, you know. Uh, so, part of yeah, it. Part yeah. of it, right? So, but what happened was that they, it comp the brain helped to reroute everything by itself, uh, which then proves the point whereby it's not compartmentalized as where they initially thought it would be. So, I would assume that bodily functions and everything as well uh, function in a very similar way, whereby the brain is able to adapt to these things, right? Neuroplasticity at its ah, best. Okay. So... Like you mentioned, yeah, the, the brain is able to compensate if it can. And I think this is like a very interesting field that is emerging where we see also how the brain is compensating for like certain things. But again, it all really depends on the context, on the injury and mm. how well, what the exact case study is. Right. And um, that being said, that's a scientific part. I'm going to circle back to yes. <laughs> the organizational side of things, right? Yes. You're now an organizational psychologist and you provide all these consultancy services and all. What have been the biggest, I don't know, the most common questions that they ask you? This is like, okay, basically what I'm saying is that what seems so obvious but it's not? What I've gotten a lot was mastering emotions. So they're asking you, how can I master my emotions? Yes, for example, anger management. Okay, so don't be angry. It's not so easy. It's, yeah, not, it's not so, so easy. easy. Think about it. Think about <laughs> it. Oh, trust me. Oh, it's not I know. easy. I've, every day. Yeah. Okay. Um, anxiety. And then I would also say how to break free and break free from bad limiting beliefs mm. and to move onwards. For lots of people, I realize they feel stuck in their careers. Some people get get into a career that they never wanted to get into in the first place. Oh, yeah. Some people are stuck in a position but do not know how. So it's lots of limiting beliefs about how to break free and gain confidence, mm. how to speak up for themselves, how to communicate properly, how to understand emotions and master these emotions and regulate these emotions, how to also... Have better time management. I think this is like one one key factor that lots of people do not understand that how to work effectively. Ah. There is a certain time that every individual has where they work better than the other. And if you also know it, our attention span is very short and lots of hours in a day are actually used for not necessarily doing deep work. So ah. okay. really looking at how we can optimize these things. Right. Hey, walk me through the process, right, mm -hmm. of, of how one person, or at least how, how you're actually sharing this, let's say, for example, again, anger management or in the office, right? So obviously you don't get angry, punch someone in the face because, you know, they didn't turn up their work on time, right? Mm -hmm. It's not teachers and everything, and all, every leader would be out of a job and in jail, probably. <laughs> but how, walk me through the process because you have to kind of explain it Right, and it's so strange to say. Well, you know, it's normal to get angry, but you shouldn't get angry, and this is how you manage it. And then, not only that, that's just a theory. How do you get them to practice it? If somebody is aware that they are struggling with something, then this is already the biggest hurdle done. Mm. If I am aware, for example, that I am struggling, or somebody is aware that they are struggling with anger at the workplace, 
then this means that we have already reached a point where this person is open to change. Ah. So once a person is open to change, then we can really dig deep and figure out where is this anger coming from? What situations are making this person angry? And what are the reactions? Where is it coming from? And how does a person have like, how did this person, for example, learn these reactions? What are the coping mechanism that this person is using? Is it a defense mechanism? Is it releasing energy? And how can we do mm. these things better? I think this is like one of the things. Um, this in comparison to somebody who does have issues with anger that affects other people, uh -huh. but who is unaware of it, but it affects the organizational culture right. and climate of a team, for example. So this would be like a different problem. How, how big of an organization, right, should it be? I guess I'm not looking for an arbitrary number or answer, but how big of an organization should actually take on their own organizational psychologist? I think for an organizational psychologist focuses a lot on how to make things more smooth, more balanced, and also gives support for the people. I think also some organizations need to have a well-being specialist in that sense that could also help. It depends really on what is the culture and what is the climate. Mm. It is hard to say that organization A operates the yeah. same as organization B because what is the field? What are the problems? What are the struggles? What is the work culture? Right. What is leadership like? What are the managers mm. like? So it's really looking at all of these different yeah. factors that give you a lot of data. Right. One, one of why I'm asking that question is because I think in general, there are many companies out there who are actually thinking that, okay, we've grown to a certain size. We should get somebody or an expert in here to look at mental health, for mm -hmm. example, yeah. about how our organization is thinking, how we're dealing with each other and managing all these stresses mm -hmm. uh, in and out of the office. Can yeah. we provide that? You see, the only, I think the main organizations that actually have these are like paramedics, uh, hospitals or anything that's really got to do with highly like PTSD mm, right yeah. uh, situations but truth be told call centers for example need something like that I used to do that job so I know you were at a call center it's something like that yeah it's I used to do hard. oh yeah. it's hard when you look as a guy it's you, you like when you're going out looking for dates right with with like okay yeah. you know back in the day right yeah. when it was still fashionable to approach a lady <clears throat> Without when we didn't have handphones, okay? So yeah, for without swiping. Yeah, without swiping, right? You actually had to go up and ask for a phone number. You know, I had to have some game and talk to them and stuff. So it was okay to receive the no, mm -hmm. right? You get used to it. But when, when you're on the call and your livelihood depends on it, you get paid by the deal, man, getting those no's can be very stressful. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, uh, they don't employ enough people to handle uh, uh, um, mental health issues, mm -hmm. right? So I, it kind of dawned on me that even small teams or small companies should also have somebody who is at least kind of, I don't know, it's not psychotherapy, but at least there's some champion for well mental wellness, right? Uh, to understand these things. But then the irony comes in whereby because the company's a startup, everybody's stressed out, everybody's trying to do their thing, I can't care about your mental health if I can't even deal with my own work. Yes. <laughs> well, in a utopian world, I would wish for every person mm. in an organization or not to have a well-being therapist right. in a way. Not well-being in a sense of wellness, like for mental well-being because it ties back to physical well-being mm -hmm. as well. And I think, unfortunately, our, our insurance culture... <laughs> focuses more on the physical well-being aspect instead of the mental well-being mm. aspect. And that's why it is hard for many people to justify who do not have financial resources to get help, to who do not have the ability to get help simply because of financial resources, stigma attached to it as well. So I think the first step, as you mentioned, could be that organizations could have their own in-house Maybe third party, but still in house, so not like blur the lines in a way, and it cannot be, cannot be like something that is too tightly connected mm. to the organization. 
In other words, call you, right? <laughs> yes. Yes. Please call me. <laughs> okay. So stay on till the end of the podcast. Marissa is going to be uh, giving her contact details, and I'll also be putting that into the description and all the data below. Okay. So whatever it is, if you really have those needs, please uh, contact experts. Marissa is definitely available for something like that. So wink, wink. Uh, give her a call. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that being said, right? Like. What I also wanted to ask you is, again, back to the organizational part. Yes, we need the people there. We need to understand and be cognizant of that our organization may need support like that, right? That's one thing. Um, but again, with all this understanding and all this knowledge that's coming through, data is everywhere. You can pick it up from the internet. What are the organizations, in your opinion, missing out right now in your area of work? I think what I have seen recently or what some of my clients, individual clients that came up to me with are when you get an appraisal, right? Then they are left with this appraisal and then they have gone through HR or with their manager with it, but they do not get the support to actually do the changes that were suggested. Mm. So this is something that I have recently seen that some clients come up to me and it's like, I have these 20 pages of my appraisal and I know what to do, but I don't know how. How can I change if I do not have the support, a coach, uh, somebody who can guide me through it and also help me step by step make these changes and make myself hold accountable for it. So this is something that I'm working on with clients that we are really taking this feedback to heart and also translating it for them because as a sub as somebody who is getting, getting this appraisal, I am very subjective. I am taking things very personally, right? I'm taking things very emotionally if somebody criticizes me or criticizes my personality and character. So if you have a guide or a mentor who can coach you through it from an objective point of view and take you back to a point where it's like an objective point of view, it is not everything is like an emotional story or an attack on you. This is something that would be, I think, for the benefits of a company and its people. You really need a guide and a coach to get people to make these changes effectively, continuously to really achieve like a lasting change oh. for the betterment of the people and the company. Wow. Okay. So it's not as simple as it sounds, huh? It's not as simple as we talk about, like, oh, yeah, you just need to have somebody, the two teams and stuff, right? It's it's hard to lead a team of, like, lots of people, right? Because you are technically, let's just, like, simplify it, like, looking for KPIs. If you're, like, a manager of a team, you have your own KPIs to the company yeah, that yeah. you um, are bound to, in a way, and that you want to achieve. But then... For these people, it's really personal. It's really personal to get this feedback and some feedback can be really harsh and difficult to process. So if you have an outside person who is not where the KPI is the person, it's not what am I achieving for this organization? I need to like cross the sales number. I need to achieve like this X amount, but the KPI is this person and their personal development. You care and this is like the first and foremost that you grow this person to the change that they can achieve to like their personal development to you you unlock this potential in the person and this is like beneficial for mm -hmm. the company and the persons and the people who work there wow i just got a message last week where somebody that i've I met at an event mentioned that they just got like their appraisal about emotional intelligence and then they were like well, I do not know. I don't. I know what emotional intelligence is, he mentioned, but I don't know what to do with it. So what do you do with all of this feedback, all of this data that these companies have been gathering for so long to like put together this beautiful 360 feedback portfolio? But what do you do with it? The next step is to really take these people and mentor them and coach them and work with them. This is hard for like a team leader mm. who is maybe leading teams of 20, 30 people. But this is like some somewhere where then an organizational coach can come in and help work on career, on soft skill development, on EI development, on cultural development. Yeah. And what's the realistic timeline for change that happened? Because 
it's very easy to say, okay, fire that person, bring in another leader, and let's see, I want results in three months. It's hard. It doesn't work that because way. Because you cannot say that person A is the same like person B. Mm. And then having somebody who is maybe informed like in psychology helps also to uncover what are maybe the hindrances. Why is a person not communicating effectively? Is there something that happened in the past that has eaten away at this confidence of this person? So it's lots of layers. It all depends on right. context. But I, I don't think it's something that we could... eat honestly say that it's like okay we'll solve your problem in three months you know it's like kind of like okay change the tv and everything's gonna be okay yeah. <laughs> it's not gonna be so easy say for somebody who for example if your feedback has been that you need to be a better public speaker or uh -huh. present better your presentations because you are in a role who needs to speak to for example other businesses and clients more frequently if this is somebody who has been, for example, hypothetically bullied in high school, has been Ugh. eaten at confidence and self-esteem, but is really good at their job, but is lacking this core skill, you cannot say, sure, let's fix it within a week. You can't, because it's something that has been ingrained for so long. But then you look at it like, what are the strategies that we can work on to release these thought patterns mm. that have been embedded for so long? to really break free from that and let them go for good. Right. Not something that is a quick band-aid fix. Yep. You want to grow for good. Have you ever met a client that goes, nah, this is taking too long. Make it quick. Make it quicker. No. Heal him quicker. <laughs> 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 Luckily not. Luckily not. But the frustration comes mm. for the individual clients because in the beginning, you're always very motivated. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. You're yeah. always very motivated yeah. because you have come to these conclusions that you want change and you like storm through the door and you're just like, I am ready. I get to do this. I can do this. And usually after two weeks, it gets really hard. It gets really hard because something came in and your usual routine suddenly creep back in. The changes that you've made because something else has happened at work that suddenly made you believe otherwise and suddenly you find yourself maybe even a step back from the right. starting line where you were and then you go back into this this thoughts of like i'm not good enough i'm not worthy of or i cannot do this mm. and then getting out of that hole just takes so much more energy but you can you just have to believe in yourself it sounds really silly but it is hard work. I mean, really, if you have thought a certain way for 30 years, can you really accept, uh, expect of yourself that you can make changes to change how you think in two weeks, 30 years compared to two weeks? It's mm. hard. So you need to forgive yourself again yeah. and give yourself the time to grow. Wow. So it's interesting that you mentioned two weeks because that seems to be the magic number, right? <laughs> I, I do recall that. Well, is it because it takes... Well, how long does it take to create a new habit? Is it 14 days or is well, it Well, pop culture would say that it's three weeks. Uh -huh. But it really depends on how often you implement it. Yep. For some, it takes three weeks. For some, it could be less. For some, it could take months even. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. But the pop culture number is three weeks. Right. And and you, you mentioned that people get demotivated. I, again, I'm... I'm don't know if this is kind of a an average or an industry average, if you wanted to call it that, that people get demotivated after about two weeks of effort. Is Do you think that's really, is, is that what the number really is? I'm taking this from my personal <laughs> experience <laughs> because I think the first, week's is, first week is fantastic because yeah. if you also plan it, say, say for example, you want to change a habit or you want to learn something new or you want to change something about yourself, whichever it is, let's talk for habits. Um, because you mentioned it before, the first week you're motivated and you kind of plan it, mm -hmm, right? You mm -hmm. can like schedule your whole days or your week where you go, okay, I'm going to work out four times a week and I'm going to schedule it straight away. But next week you're all, you're scheduling it and suddenly, oh no, my boss has like called a meeting or I need to work late. So you're missing one. And then you go, ah, one is okay. And then a couple of days later, oh, I feel so sluggish. It's raining. I don't want to go anywhere. You're missing another one. And like, whoops, whoops, suddenly you're back in front of Netflix and you are back into your old ways. It is hard. It is hard to keep that motivation going. But it's really about consistency. It's not about what is the end result. And it's not a sprint. 
it's a marathon. And the thing is, you want to keep running because mm. you want to also continuously getting better. Right. Say you have mastered a habit. It doesn't mean that that's the end of the road because uh -huh. then you have set just a new starting line and you want to grow further. It's okay to have pit stops, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, life wouldn't be fun without pit stops, right? Yeah, you got to take the scenic route sometimes. Yes. Yeah, so if you say, I want to lose weight or get rid of the sugar, but you also treat yourself to an amazing Sunday brunch because you live. We live. Yeah, she's mentioning this because I felt guilty about cutting sugar. <laughs> and, and just to let you, know, you guys know, I had a lot of ice cream last night, which didn't go so well for me. Anyway, too much of a good thing is then not good anymore, isn't it? I feel fat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I gotta I gotta lose that. Yeah, but it, it, thank you so much for that because it gives me a lot of um, insight. Really, really does in terms of creating habits, in terms of being able to forgive oneself a little bit more, being able to forgive others a little bit more, and. Taking the effort, really, I think it's taking the time and the effort, right? To just take a step back and go, okay, look, I, I'm upset. There's a reason why I'm upset, but what's going on over here? Let's try and then see that first. And the disassociation from the situation is the, one of the most difficult things to do because it's so easy to take things personally nowadays. Yeah, and I think it's also, like you mentioned, taking a step back mm. is putting yourself back in control, Right. We as humans, we have this amazing capability that we can think about our thinking. You can think about your thoughts. So take a step back and think, why am I thinking this way? Why am I feeling this way? Like you said, disassociate for one mm. second and take a pause right. and ask yourself, where is this coming from? Is this coming from a place of ego or is this coming from something that is way deeper? Or does this anger or this like, reaction to a situation have even anything to do with the situation? Mm. Because sometimes it's also spilling over from moments or things that have happened in the past, but the energy is being released right. into a situation right. that has nothing to do with it. Yeah, I, I, Personally, I take the approach for uh, the Edward de Bono's thinking hats. So I literally have to spread myself across this number of thinking hats and people around mm. the table and go, okay, hey, uh, what's the issue here? Okay, this is what's happening. No, 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 no. The other one. Look at it this way. Look at it that way as well. So yeah. that's literally how I do it mm -hmm. uh, on my end. What's your process? With empathy in particular? Uh, problem solving, empathy, dealing with anger, not wanting to hit your kids. You know, I mean, come on. It is what it is. <laughs> um, I said, I think patience is patience and pause are like, I think the first things that I would go for where I was like, okay, rationalize for a minute to calm down and come from a place of serenity uh -huh. instead of heat. And then to understand where everybody is at. Like, what is the problem? What is the context of the problem? Like the context of a problem. What is the context of the whole situation? For example, with my children, when they are upset, are they upset at me, at themselves, or at something else? Mm. And sometimes we take it personally. Sometimes we go, why are you upset at me and why are you screaming at me? But because I am the adult, I am the receiver of this energy. But where is this energy originally coming from? What is the original problem? And then to be empathetic enough to absorb this energy and go, I am here for you. I see you and I understand you. And even sometimes if I don't understand you, I'm just here for you. And that's already enough for most people. It's so powerful to be able to just sit down and just say, it's okay. Yeah. Tell me. And that's it, right? You don't need to give them a solution. You don't need to tell them, I feel for you or anything like that. Just talk yeah. to me. I think for most people, sadly, they do not have a person like that and this is something that we really should think about do we have a person in our lives who unconditionally will listen to us and take us for who we are some people have that in a partner some people have that in a parent some people have that in a friend but sadly lots of people don't have anyone 
And in this moment, you really think that everybody should have a person who will unconditionally, without judgment, listen to them. Who's that person for you? Oh, um, <laughs> my husband. <laughs> oh, good answer. <laughs> so who really is that person? <laughs> no, it is. I do have to say that my husband and I, um, our relationship, it's, it's like everybody's relationship. You know, it's up and down and life and marriage is... Is, is is an amazing roller coaster, but um, I do know that if I need to, I can sit there and unconditionally tell him about my thoughts and how I feel, and I can just be myself as as good and as authentic as I can. And I also am lucky that I do have a handful of people mm. that I could call upon if I need to. I'm asking this because, like, between my wife and myself, right? Uh, um, we we have a bit of a contract. Ah, okay, I see. Was, like, this isn't a prenup, okay? This is not a prenup. Now we've been married <laughs> yeah. like twelve over years now, yeah. and uh, the contract, in that sense, it's kind of like, okay, when you come home, don't just immediately bleh, yeah. let it out. You know, yeah. like let's let's find time to go. Hey, is it a good time for us to talk? Like. Mm -hmm seek common ground yeah and does that is that something that that you do as well yes or is he like such a patron saint and he just like sits there and says, oh just tell me everything no i think i said like life comes as it is sometimes and yes these moments where life is like taken over is also happening but at the same time like you said a relationship is a dynamic between two people right and you have to have respect for each other as much as you have respect for yourself you have to go into conversations and see where are we at is this a good time to unload my energy to you mm. but sometimes you also it's okay i think to say i just don't have it at the moment can you wait can we discuss this at some other point because it not doesn't for example necessarily have to be like something about like between you two right this can be like a problem i'm facing at work or like a problem with my family but if it like agitates me this feeling and energy will spill over to like a receiver yeah and therefore you can also choose a time when it suits both parties best right i, I can't remember where i heard this but i thought it was so good right just to have that that like for example, if things are getting a bit heated, right? You're discussing something, you're talking about it, you're trying to offload, and then the other person kind of like, why didn't you do this? I'm like, oh my God, like, can you just shut up and listen, right? Mm -hmm. So the, 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 the trick in that particular piece of advice was, okay, it's, I know it's getting frustrating, a little frustrating for the both of us right now. Shall we take a break? And we'll come back to this in about 15, 20 minutes. The idea here is that Number one, to, I, to, to, to share the observation of what both of you might be feeling. The second thing is that you're to express that you're still very interested in continuing this conversation, even though it may seem heated or difficult. And then setting a time and, and basically saying that I really want to come back to this and come back. Would you like to do that as well? You know, that to me, right, was so good in terms of conflict management and, um, Okay, look, I'm not great at applying it. Okay, just a caveat. All right, I still, I still get upset <laughs> and stuff. We all do. Yeah. But truth is, uh, I found that to be so useful. And even in organizations right now, the way that I'm trying to deal with be it clients, partners, or anything like that, I say, okay, look, I'm trying to help me to understand this right now. Would you mind if you gave me a bit of time to digest this? I'll come back to you in about 20 minutes. And let's, have, let's continue this conversation. Maybe grab a cup of water or or coffee or something. This is so much better when it comes to handling difficult situations. Yes, absolutely. I do agree with you. And I think another thing that I, just when we talk about like conflict management, which I really um, enjoyed was that when... Wait, wait, sorry. You enjoy conflict? Or no, no, no. Conflict? In conflict, like a tip, a tip that I really like enjoyed and I think was really helpful as well. Like you said, that like, take a pause, right? Take mm -hmm. a pause. But... For lots of conflict, when it comes between, for example, people working on a team and organizations, is um, the the differences of ideas. You come right. from a different perspective, right? 
And then simply to just stating, instead of saying like, let's discuss this, it's like, let's debate it. Discussion usually has like an emotional value to your point. Like, this is my point mm. and I want to like push this one through. But debating kind of tries to take away the emotions out of it and say, okay, let's look at it, but we're not emotionally attached to this idea. So a lot of great tips, a lot of great information uh, that we've talked about. And it's it's amazing how this conversation's gone, you know, <laughs> no. from, from this uh, cr crazy introduction that uh, she'd never think that somebody would do for her in the first no. place. Uh, secondly, moving on to uh, career advice, career coaching, and eventually into the neuroscience and plasticity of empathy, understanding what a burnt gland is. And now here we are talking about... Uh, relationship, relationship advice relationship and advice. conflict resolution. Oh, okay, people, the lines are open. So uh, if you've got any problems, just uh, give us a call. We're ready for you. And then anyway... <laughs> Thanks. Anyway, this is, this is great. Uh, so, Marissa, um, thank you so much for spending so much time with us today. Thank and, you so much for having me. Now, uh, before we end off the podcast, there's always a quick fire round All right. of questions that we do, which is the Epic Questionnaire. So there are 10 questions total. Are you ready? I never am, but I will say yes anyway. Okay, let's go. Now, uh, question number one. One word that you like the most. Actually. <laughs> I say this apparently quite a lot. <laughs> and I just thought about it the other day because my daughter started saying it a lot too. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> One word that you dislike. I really don't know. Can we come back to that? I have, I have absolutely blank right now. Okay, sure. Yeah. If you could have a conversation with anybody, dead or alive, fictional or non-fictional, who would that be? My mother. Oh, okay. What do you say to yourself in the mirror every morning? I am worthy. Name one superpower that you'd like to have. Mind reading? Hmm. Comes with the job, I guess. Favorite dish to eat? Soto ayam. Oh, okay. Uh, favorite travel spot or the next travel spot that you like to go to? Japan. Hmm. Which part? Mm, all of it. I want to like be in a train and just like go around Japan through all seasons. Mm. Sounds like you want to live there for no. a while. No, not living there. I would just would like to travel around there and then just come back to Singapore. Mm. Okay, something in the arts that you like to do, but you have yet to do so. In the arts? Record a song with my daughter together. Okay. What does retirement look like to you? My husband and I owning a vineyard in New Zealand with an attached muscle farm and sitting on a terrace sipping white wine. Very specific. Very specific. <laughs> so that's probably one of the most specific answers I've received so far. Wonderful. And last question. How do you want to be remembered? What's your legacy? I want to be remembered as a compassionate person that had purpose. All right. And that's the questionnaire. Are you all, all 10 fantastic answers? Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, there was one that we needed to circle back, actually, yes. which is one word that you really didn't like. It could be a curse word. It's not a problem, actually. Oh, the C word. I find it oh. nasty. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's true. COVID was horrible. Yeah, COVID was awful. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that being said, uh, please uh, let, them, let them know how they can get in touch with you. Well, thank you so much. You can get in touch with me simply. You can go to my website. It's marissanasotheon.com or you can reach me over email at admin at marissanasotheon.com or you can follow also my socials at marissaln. Okay, we're going to put all of that on screen as well, right? And also in the details. So thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Epic Podcast. Shot right here over at City Music. All right, we've got a collaboration going. Again, thank you so much to the people at City Music. Thank you so much for Marissa for coming down. Thank you for having me. Spending time with us today, sharing so much. We'll see you in the next episode of the Epic Podcast. Bye, everyone.